Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Jody, your host today, and I'm speaking with Professor Tamara Konetska from the Department of Public Health Sciences with a secondary appointment in the Department of Medicine. Professor Konetska is an internationally recognized expert in the health economics of long-term and post-acute care. She's here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Konetska. My name is Tamara Konetska. I'm a professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences with a secondary appointment in uh, the Department of Medicine, the section of geriatrics. I'm a health economist by training. My PhD is in health economics, uh, health policy and administration. And uh, that means basically um, that I uh, use the tools of economics to study questions about health policy empirically. So a lot of my research focuses on the connections between economic incentives and quality of care and healthcare. And a lot of that is focused on long-term and post-acute care settings. So I could, I could talk a little bit more about each one of those parts. Um, but before I uh, talk more about the research, I can tell you that uh, in my department, like many schools of public health or departments that are similar to ours, um, we as faculty have roles in uh, research, uh, mentoring, and teaching. And along with our research, we also generally apply for grants um, to support our research. So that's kind of environment we're in. There's a heavy emphasis on the research part. Um, I teach one course per year and I mentor a lot of students. Just only one course. Is that a one semester course or the whole year long? It's one quarter long course, so not even a semester. Um, so I basically teach 10 weeks out of the year, and that's typical for faculty in our department. Um, and our courses are all at the graduate level and are pretty small. So I teach, I have been teaching an introduction to health economics kind of course, um, where I generally get you know 20 or 25 students but now I'm switching over to just teaching a more advanced doctoral seminar. And there I usually get, you know, six to 10 students per year. And, uh, you know, the reason for this is that, uh, you know, I think in, uh, in fields like mine, <laughs> you mm -hmm. sort of pick your poison in some way, right? There are some departments that are just uh, really focused on teaching and you have to really cram your research in on the side. And those kinds of departments, um, let's say typical schools of public policy, say, those kind of departments, they don't really expect a lot of grant funding and the emphasis is, is more on teaching. In our world, um, because there's such a heavy emphasis on grants funding and, um, and in fact, I do need a lot of funds to buy the very expensive data I use, <laughs> Etc. And I have entire teams of people working on my research projects. Um, to do all of that, the, re the, the research focus is very heavy. So, so before we get into too many details around the research, and I know I've been I've been looking over um, your website on the university website, uh, your page on the university website a bit, and I can see that you've published a lot of things and are you have your hands in a lot of pots, including. Um, things related to the recent COVID-19 pandemic. So I want to hear more about that, but let's, let's like cycle back to when you were young is, did you always dream of like playing around with big data or what did, what did you think you wanted to do when you were younger? I, yeah, I had had a very strange trajectory leading me to health economics and academia. Mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, perhaps because I was the child of immigrants um, I, my focus was always very international and I wasn't really thinking about health and I wasn't really thinking about economics. I really wanted to study international law, you know, get involved in sort of international uh, policy negotiations. And uh, yeah, that's really where my interests were. I really loved learning languages. I you know, started studying German at a young age because I didn't really learn it from my parents, unfortunately. But I also, you know, I took French for a while. I took Arabic for a while. I took Spanish for a while. I just always really loved uh, learning languages and traveling and just thought my career would focus on something around international policy. Mm. 
Was there anything, can I ask, was there anything in your parents' immigration story that led you toward that? Or it was just something that was of interest? Well, they have, they both have fascinating immigration stories. My mother was a refugee um, at mm-hmm. age 12 or 13 um, in Germany. She grew up in East Prussia, um, which was Germany then, Poland now. And uh, yeah, she was an orphan and a refugee mm-hmm. um, at the age of 12 or 13 and came to the States in the 50s. My dad uh, sort of got out of the Soviet Union during World War II um, and went to Germany for 10 years before coming here also in the 50s. Interesting immigration stories, but I think, uh, you know, children of immigrants can go one of two ways. Sometimes they just really embrace American culture and don't want to have anything to do with their parents' past Mm -hmm. um, or just aren't that interested Um, or the opposite reaction. And I, I certainly have the opposite reaction. I was really always fascinated by their stories, fascinated fascinated by languages and uh, and the areas they came from. Um, and so I'm sure that inspired some of my interest in international you know, policy mm-hmm. issues. So but what was it that then that brought you toward the work you're doing now? It was a long and circuitous path. <laughs> mm. um, in, in college, um, I ended up majoring in German literature and political science, which was still somewhat aligned with um, those, you know, international policy kinds of interests. The German literature degree was really just kind of something I did along the way because I wanted to do uh, some time abroad in my undergraduate degree. (laughs) And so I spent a year and a half in Germany. And, you know, at that point, I had enough credits to have a German degree. So I never really meant to do that as a career. I, you know, took another few turns, which, you know, maybe I'll just skip over or, or I'll be talking about this forever. (laughs) <laughs> um, but at some point, I got very interested in more global international development issues. Um, and in part, that was personal because I, uh, I had met a Tunisian that I eventually got married to. It was a short-lived marriage. But for um, a long time, I was really trying to figure out how I was going to have a career in North Africa. And uh, so I started taking a lot more kind of development economics Um, I ended up getting a master's degree in urban and regional planning as a kind of practical tool to think about doing development work in North Africa. But in the course of doing all of that, I just really discovered economics and discovered I loved economics. It kind of coincided with that relationship falling apart (laughs) um, that I decided to do a PhD in economics. And so I applied all over and I got uh, into the University of Pennsylvania and uh, it was the best place I got into. I just applied to all the top departments in the country. And I went there. And um, I learned a lot, but it was a terrible, terrible fit for me. And I wasn't interested in health. And I was still trying to do development economics, uh, development kinds of issues. It was a terrible fit. Uh, and, and so this is one of those lessons I learned that I love to tell people who are thinking about where to go to college or where to go to grad school. <laughs> because, you know, going to the best place is not always the best fit. And I think fit is much more important than ranking of some sort. It was a terrible fit for me because I was very interested in, in applied work. I was, affected, I was interested in affecting policy and changing people's lives. And, and Penn was a very theoretical department, uh, which also, by the way, had zero women on the faculty at that time. Oh. And um, it was just not a great environment for me and not a great uh, fit in terms of the substantive interests of the department. And so I left it in the middle Mm -hmm. of my PhD program and went and worked in DC for five years. And that was when sort of by chance I got into healthcare Mm -hmm. and, uh, I ended up working for a long-term care trade association in Washington, DC, discovered that I loved those issues, that there were a lot of problems to solve. Mm. And uh, that I still really wanted a PhD. And so I went mm. back and did a PhD through public health um, at UNC Chapel Hill. So that was kind of how I got to health economics, um, a long and circuitous route. But to be honest, a lot of people in my department have had odd and circuitous routes to where they are. And I think that's partly a characteristic of public health. You know, it's a very mm. multidisciplinary field. 
And we all believe that it, it kind of helps have a broad perspective if you've had a lot of different experiences. Yeah. Do you remember the work you were, the projects you were working on when you were um, in DC, figuring out that you were, this was what your destiny was? Oh, certainly. Um, those left a big mark on me. And I think in general, trade associations are a great place to learn a lot, um, to learn a lot about policymaking um, and to learn a lot of substance. So the organization I worked for, the American Healthcare Association, they're known as the big nursing home lobby. Um, there are a couple of these associations, but I completely stayed away from the lobbying side of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, once in a while I had to go to a congressional hearing or something like that, but I did not spend a lot of time on that. I was mostly doing regulatory analysis. And mm -hmm. so I would do research projects on questions that I thought were really, really interesting. Like if they change the regulatory system and change the way they sanction nursing homes that have quality problems, you know, what are going to be the, the consequences of that? Will quality actually improve? Will there be unintended consequences? Or, you know, how do we think about the right way to pay nursing homes to incentivize high quality of care? Um, so projects like that involved more interaction with regulatory bodies like uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and also drew on you know real research and problem solving skills. Um, just fascinated me. Hmm. And I, I have to say, I was also this was just my first exposure to long term care, and long term care is a huge challenge in this country. And so I think that experience also just made me realize substantively that, yes, here's a huge public policy problem to solve. And I want to do something to, to contribute to, you know, making that situation better. So was that an interest that you took back to graduate school with you when you completed your PhD? Was your dissertation also on long-term care economics? It was, and it's it's something I've taken with me all of this time. I mean, I've been at University of Chicago now for almost 20 years, and I'm still studying long-term care. Mm -hmm. My dissertation, which you know I, I, I did right after that uh, uh, trade association experience, was about uh, a major change to the payment system and how we pay for rehabilitative care in nursing homes and, and what that did to the quality of care throughout the nursing home. And since then, uh, I've, you know, studied hospitals a little bit. I've studied some other sectors, but mostly I uh, still focus on long-term and post-acute care um, in part because, you know, I think for me, having had that much exposure to those issues, um, it's really easy to identify, you know, what the big unanswered questions are. So I know uh, I was doing a little reading before our conversation and saw that you had you had been to the Senate to testify on on long term care during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about how your research translates to took you back to Washington and, and translated to that specific policy um, work? I should preface that by saying that most of my research over the years, even though I'm interested in very applied issues. Mostly I'm engaged in kind of longer term research that tries to get at causal effects, right? Using the, using the tools of economics to get at causal effects. And, you know, these are research projects that sometimes take years. And I, I think they're very policy relevant, um, but to uh, sort of engage in the rigor that I want to engage in, you know, I'm, I'm an academic, right? Mm -hmm. um, so COVID kind of, changed things pretty dramatically and pretty quickly in that here was a situation where people in long-term care were really at risk. This became clear very early on in the pandemic. Um, you know, if you remember back to the first highly publicized cases at the Kirkland home in Washington, you know, the first sure, yeah. outbreak was at a nursing home and, you know, the percent of deaths that were occurring in long-term care, you know, uh, were just so much higher than in any other setting. It was, uh, it was a, a really urgent and serious problem. And um, so I and other long-term care researchers pivoted pretty quickly to trying to uh, 
create evidence in a very fast and timely uh, way that was still, you know, rigorous, but not the typical kind of long-term academic studies that we would engage in um, because people needed evidence to make policy. And mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, one of the things I've studied a lot over the years is the relationship between the sort of healthcare report cards that um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services puts out like ratings, quality ratings for nursing homes and consumer and, and provider response to those nursing homes. Um, so basically nursing homes are, you know, rated on a five point five star scale um, in terms of their quality. So I just jumped in and started looking at the relationship between COVID outbreaks and quality, discovered some really important <laughs> uh, I think we had some really important results that were counterintuitive for a lot of people. And uh, it was in some ways different from the prevailing narrative that you know nursing homes are just evil and the bad quality ones are gonna have problems. We were finding that actually all nursing homes were having problems with COVID and it all depended on what was happening in the surrounding community. Um, and okay. it turns out, you know, when people need a ton of care and you have caregivers going in and out every day, it's really hard to keep the virus out, even if you're a high quality facility. You know, our conclusions from this early research, which uh, were consistent, basically, even up to this day, was that larger facilities and facilities just in neighborhoods where the prevalence of the virus was high we're most at risk and that's where we should be directing resources. So since I was one of the first people uh, doing research in uh, that area, I was invited to testify to the Senate, um, the Special Committee on Aging in the spring of 2020 about you know, how, we can, how we can try to uh, you know, stop this tragedy in nursing homes. And then I testified again a year later um, to the Senate Finance Committee on similar issues because we hadn't really solved the problem. I learned a lot through those experiences. Uh, I really learned how to talk with congressional staff, how to focus on what's important. <laughs> I really learned how to talk with uh, media, at least in a much better way than I had before, um, because during most of that first year of the pandemic, I was on the phone with journalists basically daily and sometimes multiple times daily. And this was very, uh, a very new phenomenon in my career. So it was a big learning experience for me, but also extremely gratifying because, you know, even though I'm an academic and I engage in these long term rigorous studies, in the end, what I really want to do is improve people's lives. I want to affect policy. And this was, you know, such a such an opportunity to really have an influence on on what the government was doing. That sounds sounds amazing and a really satisfying way of bridging the the work you were doing on the, the research side of going through the the data and and then taking it and having real world implications. What are some other things that are gratifying to you in your work and continue to inspire you? Well, certainly that's one, like whenever I have an influence uh, and feel like I really affect policy, that may be one of the most important ones. Other things for me that are very gratifying for me are having an influence on students. Um, I really enjoy mentoring. I um, you know, have guided multiple doctoral students through their dissertations, and I just really enjoy seeing their uh, research develop and mature and, uh, you know, seeing them sort of being launched off into successful careers. Mm -hmm. um, that's always been really important to me. Um, the teaching as well, um, although that always feels like it's on a slightly smaller scale because I get to know them for, you know, 10 weeks and I find it gratifying to, to see what they've learned um, in my class. But the mentoring is often a multi-year relationship, sometimes a career long relationship. And so um, that's very important to me. And I'm, you know, grateful I have that opportunity to do that in my job. 
So mentoring students is like, it's a reversal of roles in a way because at some point someone mentored you, are there some mentors that you would like to acknowledge at this moment who are big supporters of you and really helped you along your path to the University of Chicago? Sure. And the risk here is always that, you know, you'll there leave are someone so out. many people and you to leave someone out. You know, looking way back to my dissertation years, 20 years ago, um, you know, certainly there were three very influential people on my committee for very different reasons. My uh, dissertation chair, Edward Norton, now at University of Michigan, you know, I was really grateful to him for just his clarity and efficiency. I mean, something that is probably, you know, undervalued in a dissertation <laughs> advisor, right? Somebody who actually wants you to get done <laughs> and you know, yeah. move on to your career. So that was, uh, that was very helpful to have him as my chair. You know, Frank Sloan, who's at Duke. So he was at a different institution than I was, um, but he was on my committee. And I did a lot of my dissertation from D.C. because at that point I had uh, met my husband who was in D.C. and I was kind of going back and forth. Frank Sloan would, you know, invite me to his home when I would drive down to Chapel Hill and, um, you know, sit at his dining room table with me for two hours at a time and go over my dissertation work. And he wasn't getting any credit for that. I wasn't even at his institution, but he right. cared. And right. so, you know, that kind of that kind of caring and dedication was invaluable. You know, plus, I just love the fact that he was so harsh, <laughs> which yeah. Um, uh, you know, harsh in the best way. Um, mm -hmm. He was really demanding. Um, and I think my research has always been better for having interacted with him. Perhaps the main person, though, on my committee that really had an influence on me, perhaps because it was in a much wider way, was Sally Stearns, who's an economist at UNC, uh, who was the person on my committee who was my life coach, as well as my research coach. Um, and I still, <laughs> I still rely on her for advice. For example, now, you know, I am the editor of a journal, for example, and she's right. done a lot of that. And so when I have sticky situations or things I'm not sure how to handle, she's the person that I turn to because she's always just had, you know, very good sage advice and was always willing to talk about these things. Um, and so it's, it's really wonderful to have, you know, for me, it was always really wonderful to have um, a woman like that um, on my committee that I could talk about, you know, when to have a kid <laughs> in terms of my career and also about, uh, you know, endogeneity in my uh, econometric design. You know, it's, it's uh, really a, a, a wonderful breadth she has offered me over the years. So when you're mentoring students now, what are some lessons that you've learned throughout your career that you like to pass on to them? Oh, there are many, I suppose. One thing that I find very important um, to pass along is just this idea that you should really do what you're passionate about. And I think, especially in a world like mine where funding is important, people start sort of chasing ideas that might be fundable, that they think other people mm. are going to like, or that, you know, sort of are just feasible given the data set that they're familiar with. Mm. And, you know, often when you do those kinds of things, you end up pursuing research questions that are a little trivial or not that interesting, <laughs> just not mm -hmm. that interesting. Um, and so one lesson I really try to pass along is, you know, find something you're really passionate about, engage in the policy debate and, and come up with those, come up with those questions that you feel like, okay, this is the burning question that everybody really wants an answer to in order to make better policy moving forward. And that's the question I'm going to try to answer. <laughs> Think big and, you know, be passionate about what you're going to research. Try not to be too strategic um, because the, the successes will kind of follow if you're passionate about what you do and really pursue it. I think that that really falls in line with conversations I've been having with a lot of your colleagues around <clears throat> the idea of foundational research and research that 
may not seem like it has it may not seem like it has clear implications for the here and now but mm -hmm. it's the research that all of the other stuff is built upon mm -hmm. so how about um ideas for people who might be thinking about coming into this field uh what what advice do you have or if there's any other advice on getting into health economics things to study or um how to find out how to identify am i really the right is this the right field for me? Right. So there are a lot of things about public health research and, and health economics research that are a little bit different from most traditional academic fields. Um, one is there are a lot of opportunities outside of academia. So one big question people really have to think about is, you know, is academia for me or not? Um, because if you study health economics, you can easily go to a think tank um, and I've had students who do that if they're not really, especially people who are uncomfortable with English and don't want to teach, for example. Um, you could also go to government. You can also go to industry. There are lots of outside options that directly use your training, right? And so that's one big uh, I think question people have to ask themselves, you know, why academia and is academia really for me? In my own case, you know, I just felt like academia was so appealing because I think compared to any other job I've had, the percent of time I think, I, the percent of time I use my brain to think about really interesting questions is much higher than in any other job I've had. <laughs> um, and then also I love the flexibility of it. But those are trade-offs, right? I love the flexibility because I can decide to take a two hour dog walk in the morning and do my work at night instead. Um, and that's great. Um, but that has to be balanced with a real drive to get things done. You know, I don't end up work just because I have flexible hours doesn't mean I work less than people who have nine to five jobs. In fact, I right. probably work a lot more. Right. And so I think people really have to think, you know, do they do they have this sort of passion and drive that's going to allow them to to really pursue their own research agenda in academia? And I, I think you need to have that in academia. Or, you know, do you, uh, do you want more structure? Do you want more uh, structure around your hours? Do you want to be free on weekends and not mm -hmm. be thinking about that paper you should be writing? Um, there, are, there are lots of trade-offs. And so I think the first question is, you know, really only do academia if, if you think it's the right fit for you. The other trade-off in our field is in public health, you can you can pursue public health through so many different kinds of departments, depending on what your degree is actually in. Mm. And um, I think it's important to know which kind of environment you're aiming for. So I love my environment because I'm very comfortable writing grants. And it turns out very good at writing grants. So I have never had a problem bringing in the funds I need to buy expensive data and hire teams of programmers and do what I want to do. Um, but some people are are really um, scared about the grants uh, uh, world and the whole prospect of applying for grants and having your research trajectory depend on those grants. And and then you know it's really important if you want academia um, to to find a place, ideally before you even do your degree, because certain degrees kind of put you on a trajectory to different kinds of departments. But it's important then to find a place where, you know, maybe the focus is more on, on teaching and grants aren't expected. And, you know, each department has its, uh, you know, advantages and disadvantages, depending on your preferences. So final question, do you ever dream of a life outside of what you're doing, something completely different, not health economics related, not in academia? Do you ever imagine yourself just someplace completely different and where would that be? Do you mean a different career? Yeah, or, yeah, like completely different. Like you own a bar in Jamaica, uh, like in <laughs> that community or something. I don't know, just for fun. Um, so it's certainly true over the years that I've sometimes dreamed of other things. Remember, I tried a lot of things before I actually got here. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I don't know that I, I dream about that a lot. Um, I do sometimes. Uh, dream about things that I thought I wanted to do um, when I was much younger, right? Dream about uh, law, for example. 
Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I think I would have really enjoyed life as a lawyer, especially doing kind of international law, even other kinds of law. Like I've always been really fascinated by tax law, right? <laughs> that would be a very different <laughs> career for me. It probably draws on similar kinds of, you know, logic and problem solving. So maybe it's not that that different. Um, but so sometimes I, I, I think about law in different directions like that. Certainly, you know, I love hiking, kayaking, walking the dog. Um, so, uh, you know, careers that just, uh, or, or spending time just sort of out in nature, I think is very um, appealing. I don't know that I've really dreamed of the, a specific career associated with that. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, you know, I've dreamed more of that's what I'm going to do when I retire. <laughs> Thank you for your time today, Professor Kanetska. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more.